but it looks like we have a few more friends coming. How are you guys this morning? Good. Are you guys still sleeping? <laughs> Some of you look like you might be ready to go back to sleep. This morning, we're going to read a story that's called Loved, the Lord's Prayer. Do you guys know how much you're loved? We have lots of things in our world that we love, but there's someone that loves all of us even more than we love all of those things. So I'm going to share that story with you. It says, Hello, Daddy. We want you to know, and or we want to know you and be close to you. Please show us how. Make everything in the world right again and in our hearts too. See all the wonderful things in the world? We have all the children and animals. I'm sure some of you have animals at home, right? That we love very much. Do what is best just like you do in heaven and please do it down here too. So we want to try to make things just as great down here on earth, right? Like God would like us to do. Please give us everything we need today. What are some things you need throughout the day? Playing and maybe food, water, the what? Extra sleep, yeah, you're right, extra sleep. I need some extra sleep today too. How about some hugs? You need hugs, yeah, and nice words. Nice words are always great too. Forgive us for doing wrong, for hurting you. They don't look too happy, do they? Sometimes we get in arguments with brothers and sisters. Maybe even mom and dad sometimes argue with us too, huh? When we're not listening so well. But forgive us just as we forgive others. When people, or pe for other people, when they hurt us. So we can always say sorry or give a hug and help each other feel better. Rescue us. We need you. We don't want to keep running away and hiding from you. Keep us safe from our enemies. You're strong, God. You can do whatever you want. And you know what's really cool? We can do a lot of things, too. We just can't do it by ourselves. We have to ask God for some help. And he'll help us do those things. You are in charge now and forever and for always. We think you're great. Amen. Yes, we do. All right. Can I pray with you guys? Lord, help these children to know just how blessed they are to be part of us. Thank you for giving them all to us. Um, to share and for us all to be able to love on them just as much as you do. Lord, help them to know you and help them to make choices that are pleasing of you as they grow throughout their lives. Amen. You guys can go back. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father, why do drafts look so funny? Please help me to never go to the dentist. Thank you for that haircut. Bless that I get apples and I have my point too. Thank you for Jesus haircut. Please help us to have pancakes in the morning. Please protect us from big hungry sharks. Please bless me not to grow a beard. Please bless that the girls won't try to kiss me at recess anymore. Please help me to be more grateful when you bless me. I'm thankful for this beautiful world that Jesus has created for us to live on. Thank you for loving us, even though we make mistakes. Please bless I can share my toys with my sister. Please help me to be a better big brother. And you know that the spirit center home when you're kind and nice. Please bless me to see others as you see them. Please bless I can with the scriptures even though I'm little. Please bless me with more trials because I know that's how I grow. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Can I get an amen from everybody else? Don't our children bless us in amazing ways? Give me an amen on that too. 
We've really enjoyed this series as we've gone through August here and celebrating and worshiping with our kids. And I'm excited to jump into the Word and connect that to this book that we just read. But before we do that, I'd like to just take care of a couple housekeeping things. One, to our guests, those who are online and there are a lot of new faces here today, which is pretty common here in August and September. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm our lead pastor, and we're just super glad you're here. I always want to reemphasize this Connect card in this worship guide. Everybody got one of these when they walked in, but this Connect card is really important to us, so one of our pastors actually can connect with you, and we would love to do that. Just even if you're visiting family here this weekend, which we get a lot with the college, uh, that's great, too. We hope you always feel like family when you're up here visiting. There's a couple things on here that I want to go over really quick with you that are important, uh, that we'll stress a lot over these three weeks. Um, baptism class, September 15th. If you have been like, I don't know, I think it's time. It's time to talk about this. It's time to think about baptism. I want to remind you, it is the biggest decision you ever make in your life. And so if you want help walking with that, come to this class. If you cannot make this date, just let us know. Shoot us a note right on the Connect card here. We'll reach out to you and find a way to make sure we can walk with you and talk about what is this biggest decision in your life. And, we want to, and then in late September, we will be having baptisms here as part of our service. We're really excited about that. On the back, in one week, all of our life groups are launching for the fall semester. Uh, we have between 25 and 30 groups going on right now that will be on every day from opposite these services on Sunday to the every day of the week. But I'd like to emphasize one thing, and that is on Wednesday night, There's a, all these are amazing, so look at them, find out where you want to plug in. Uh, this is The reason they're called life groups is because as a church, we do life all week long, not just Sunday, for an hour. It's a great refueling during a week. It's a great way to grow uh, closer to the community. And so, but one that's, that's really important that we do in here too, that's really purposeful is Wednesday night. Wednesday night at 5.30, we serve a meal here and we have kids programming. We have kids, we watch kids all the way through babies. So parents, young parents especially can come here on that night too and not have all the crazy. But on that night, we're launching several new groups. There is a marriage class, the art of marriage. There is a class on finance. If we're just so upended in money, it goes after it biblically. How do we get set free from the issues of money? There's also a class for brand new believers, like who is Jesus? Like what is all this about? There's a starting point class, and there's an emotionally healthy relationship class that night too that helps us. How do I have strong spiritual relationships on the horizontal with others? And there's another one called Military Life, and it's designed, Callie is amazing, she understands the military life, she understands deployments, the hardships the families go through, and it's a great way to come there if we're struggling with balancing or just looking at how do we handle this military life. We have so many military families here. So just, we'll hit this one more time next week, but it starts next Sunday and throughout that week. We would love, we have a small goal, 100%. 100% of everybody doing life together, amen? Because that's church, that's how we grow. That's how we grow, so we'd love to have you in there. I want to welcome those who are online with us too. Uh, these, this worship guide, everything is posted out there on Facebook Live and on our website, so you can follow along with that also. Let's see, did I catch everything? Baptism Life Groups, announcements, yes. So we're excited, we're actually, it's kind of a sad day and super happy day. We're in the last week of this Tell Me the Story sermon series where we we engage with our kids, we bring them in worship, we share this children's story, and then we actually take it and go deeper with the adults, and we go into the Bible, the biblical story. And so over the last four weeks, we've, we've looked at God's view of us and the love of us in a children's book. We went into scripture about that. We went into sin, a children's book about how sin escalates and just overpowers our lives. The third week we went over, what was that? The depth of sadness. It's a children's book that showed us sadness and talked about sadness. We went to the biblical view of it too. And this week, as you saw, we worked on this neat book called Loved. It's the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to talk today about the Lord's Prayer, probably in a way you've never seen it before. And so I'm excited about jumping into this. Um, there's a thought I had, and it just zipped away. Uh, there's a reason. There it is. There's a reason why we're doing all this. Why are we hanging out in kids' books? Why are we trying to go back and simplify things? Why are we trying, you know, what's the purpose of this? And every week I've shared with you out of Matthew 18, this important scripture. It's like tension. There we go. Jesus said, 
Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Like, <gasps> take your breath away, doesn't it? Therefore, whoever takes a lowly position like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And what we're learning from this, and what we've really emphasized the last month, what is, this, what is Jesus saying here? This is a big thing, unless you change to be like a child. And what he's, what he's sharing with us, unless we become like children at heart, that we are humble, that we're trusting, and that we're dependent on him, unless we can go back to that, we will struggle. And as adults, what happens to us? We become less humble, less trusting, and more independent. And Jesus is saying, get your hearts back with the Father. Get your hearts back like a child. And that's what we're doing this and examining this. And we're going to do that in the Lord's Prayer. It's a great way to finish today. For those of you in this room that know this is a struggle, being humble, dependent, trusting, let's all go there today. I struggle too. Let's go there today and let's pray together. Let's ask the Holy Spirit's help as we go into God's Word together. Holy Spirit, you are God's presence in Jesus here now, and you are the only one that takes the words off this page, off these books, and illuminates them in our heart. And you are the only one that can change us, and we can be stubborn. But I know deep down all of us want that childlike heart. We want to be humble. We put God and others first. We want to be trusting of your word and trusting of you and every promise you've given us. And we want to be dependent on you. We want to wake up every morning saying, Lord, I can't do this without you. And so give us that heart to say, Holy Spirit, work on us. If this chaps our hide, we're okay with that because that means you're at work. So Holy Spirit, we give you multiple hearts today. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So one thing I was thinking when I was starting this, I was thinking, man, life, <laughs> life is full of moments that take your breath away. Amen. And there's one moment that always takes my breath away is where I'm sitting there just having a normal day. I'm hanging out with folks and just like, and this, this moment always gets my blood pressure up, my heart rate increases, I breathe faster, and my mind just races. You know what that is? It's when somebody looks at me and says, Brian, will you pray? I was like, oh, yes, pray. You know, my mind starts racing. Well, I'm gonna pray. What am I gonna do? My heart rate goes up, my blood pressure goes up. And I was like, and there's, for a lot of us, it's when somebody says, hey, will you pray? It's like, what? No, I don't want to pray. It's like, yes, I should pray, but how do I pray? Have you struggled with that? Have you ever been put on a spot and it's like, oh, what do I pray? How do I pray? Michael Jr. had to struggle too, and I think all of you will relate to this. Watch this. <laughs> and then going to church can be a little intimidating sometimes, like you're trying to look for the right church. You'll never find the perfect church, so you just stop looking for the perfect church because you ain't perfect. But I went to one church, and uh, the pastor was like, I want you to pray with your neighbor. I'm like, my neighbor don't go to this church. <laughs> you want me to call my neighbor on the phone? That's creepy. So they explain to me, your neighbor is the person next to you. I'm supposed to pray with some lady I don't even know? What am I supposed to pray about? Lord, help them hairs to stop growing on this lady's chin, Lord. I don't, what am I supposed to pray about? I don't even know her. And she went first. Man, she must have been John the Baptist's auntie or something, man. And she prayed all good. She was like, dear Heavenly Father, you said in your word in the sixth chapter, the third, third verse, Lord, of the book of Matthew, Lord, the 601st word on page 1297, Lord. Lord, you said, seek, search, Lord. You're the Alpha Nisi, Jehovah Jireh, the King of Kings. I'm thinking, man, she even knows his nicknames. <laughs> now she's looking at me like it's my turn to pray. Well, I'm not going to let her out pray me. So I'm like, all right, dear God, God, I just, you, I just, I just can't fight this feeling anymore. <laughs> no, you know, because I know, Lord, that nationwide, you're on my side, God, and because, because choosy moms choose Jesus, Lord, you know. As the rocket's red glare, Lord, okay, proof to the night. I believe I can fly, Amen. Then I got 
got baptized. So a lot of this can actually correlate with this, right? It's like praying. So for those of us who struggle with pray, prayer, it's okay. Today we're going to help quite a bit with this. For our prayer warriors here, would you, like, okay, I hope this is new to you, what we're going to go into, but I hope you can use this to help others learn how to pray. To me, when I sit in a room, the most authentic prayer, the most beautiful prayer, usually comes out of the mouth of a child or a new believer because it's always from the heart. And that is the most beautiful prayer. And that's the prayer people I like to be around. I'm not always a polished. I mean, we, anyway, I'll go, I'll, I'll, we'll cover that. So in Matthew 6, I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6 in the Gospel of Matthew, way towards about four-fifths of the way through your Bible. And here we learn Jesus teaches us how to pray. And, and we want to cover all this, just this scripture where he goes over this. And his disciples were always admiring how Jesus prayed. And they're like, man, could you teach us to pray like you? And Jesus does this. And that's what we're going to go through today to help us know about praying and what I think is really interesting, and so, and, and another thing too, if you don't have a Bible today, um, there are Bibles up here. If you don't want to do the walk like of fear and come up here, there's actually Bibles back on those little stands. Please take one, keep it. Um, we want you to walk along with us every time, but we'll have them up here overhead too. But what's interesting, when Jesus gives instruction how to pray, he actually starts with how not to pray. He actually gives two tips on, okay, but don't do this first. And so let's start here. In Matthew 6, starting in verse, <laughs> excuse me, verse 5, Jesus writes, he, he shares with his disciples, he says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. So Jesus begins with a, a not. Um, he says, hey, before we go into how to pray, let's talk about how not. Don't be like the hypocrites. For those of us who knew a little bit of the language or the first century Greek word hypocrite meant actor. And so there's actors all times and plays in the Greek culture. And he said, don't be like a play actor. Don't do this for show don't do prayer for show and we're like going well yeah we don't do that guys we do when whenever somebody says would you pray and you're like going uh oh and so what's your mind going to it's like how can i pray really good i want to pray really good in front of everybody i want that can be that can be like a show he's saying don't do that he said if you do it for show you'll get all the reward right there you'll get the show but he says Pray in private. Your, your version might say, pray in secret to the Father. Close the door. Now, he's not against corporate prayer. He's not against praying in a public space. But he's showing us something important here. When he says private or secret prayer, what he's talking about is when you pray, there are only eyes on you from God and your eyes on God because you are actually talking to the Father. So he says eyes on. And that's what it means by prayer, private and secret. And then he continues with a second not. Uh, verse 7, he says, When you pray, don't babble on and on and on as the Gentiles, or your version might say the pagans do. Anybody that's not Jewish. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again and again and again. Don't be like them. For your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask. And so what's interesting is, like, we look at this and think, okay, well, I don't really have a context for this. Let me give you the context for first century Jews when he writes this. If you write down Acts 19 in your margin there on your notes, Acts 19 is where uh, they, they deal with the pagan priests that are that in, in Ephesus. And it says the pagans prayed this prayer, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And it says they prayed it for two hours straight, just those words. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, the false god Artemis. Great is the Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is the Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is the Artemis of the Ephesians for two hours. And if you go to, write 1 Kings 18 on your margin. That's where Elijah took on the, the pagan priests, and they prayed just these four words, O Baal, answer us. O Baal, answer us. And it says they did it from morning till noon. Four hours. Do you, you want to sit there for four hours and hear... Oh, Bill, answer us. But what he's saying here is he's saying vain repetition. 
vain repetition, praying that you think you're going to force God's hand by just saying it over and over and over, but vain repetition is not the way to pray. And what I know is our church is such a smorgasbord of people. I come out of a Catholic faith, okay, a Catholic background. And I remember when I first met the rosary. You know, in the rosary, we would say the rosary, there's 53 Hail Marys, there is six Our Fathers, six Glory Bees, or the Apostles' Creed, and we would knock it out in 10 or 15 minutes or less. So what's the difference between repetition that is good and repetition that is vain? So I was like, because some repetition is good. When I'm hurting, I will cry out the same thing over and over and over to the Father. So how do I know the difference between vain repetition and good repetition? Like, it's okay to repeat. It's hearing. And then I saw a quote by uh, uh, R. Kent Hughes, theologian, pastor. He said this. This is how we know. Our lips are moving, but our hearts and minds stand still. In repetition, if my heart and my mind is aligned with my lips, I'm in a good place. But so many times we get the repetition, all that's happening is our lips are moving, and our Christian prayers can be just like pagan prayers. God's always after our heart. So what he's saying in these two things, these two knots, is he's saying, hey, when it comes to praying for show or praying like babbling on and on, when you pray like that, you have a very wrong view of God. And, and if I can give you one tip, I like this tip. It's not... I don't ever want to force anybody into praying only one way. But what I love the fact is that prayer is, is I know the Father is there, Jesus is there, the Holy Spirit, I'm talking to him all day long. So Martin Luther, the Reformation, said, here's, here's three ways you pray, brief, frequent, and intense. Brief, God knows what, you, what you're saying and what you want. Brief, and when we're brief, we tend to be more frequent, and when we're doing that, be intense. I don't want to give you there's just one way, but I like the beauty of that. And as a matter of fact, Martin Luther was mimicking several of the early church fathers to say, pray short, pray intense with your heart, and pray often. Talk to him all day long like he's right there because he is. So that's the knot. So Jesus kind of interesting. He says, that's the knot. So let's don't do that. And that really meant a lot. They, they would have saw this every day, the show, the babbling. So he says, here's the way to pray. And this is praying with the right view of God. Now, I want you to really pay attention as we go into these next verses because this is the only place in the Bible where we get a clear definition of how to pray. The only place. And what's unique about it, it's smack dab actually in the exact middle of the Sermon on the Mount. I think it's there for a reason. Right in the middle of the most, the most precious sermon ever given by Jesus, right in the middle, is how to pray. And what I want you to understand is when we look at the Lord's Prayer together, like we did in the children's book, when we look at this together and walk through it, what we got to understand is how we see it today is much different than, they, than how they saw it. Two things that Jesus is teaching them when he gives them the Lord's Prayer is one is the intimacy, and they would have never experienced this before. And the second thing is a revolutionary concept of what he's given them because they've never prayed like this before either. And the reason why they've never prayed like this before is because Jesus is giving them a foretaste now that they would not be able to pay, pray this prayer at all without his life, his death, and his resurrection. What he's telling them, I am going to hang on a cross, give my life for you, and I will rise in three days. If those don't happen, guys, this prayer, it will not work. It will not make any sense to us. And I think you'll see that as we go through it. This is so revolutionary to them. For us, it's pretty routine. But when we really look at the heart of it in the first century, this was crazy revolutionary and crazy intimate that they would have never experienced before. And Jesus says, I'm going to make the way that all this works so you can pray like this. So let's jump into it. Matthew verse 9 and chapter 6. We'll start there. And so if you are comfortable with this, I really encourage you, grab your highlighter or pen. If you're okay with writing on in your paper copy of the Bible, I would encourage you to underline some certain words as we go through each one. So Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, I want you to first underline the word our. 
You know, also didn't say my father. There's something really powerful about the word our, recognizing right away that we are one big family. And it's not about me. And the second thing to recognize is I'm never praying alone. And the third thing to recognize is everybody in our is here on equal footing. Male, female, Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter. We're all here as our. So I think the very first word's powerful. Second word, father, underline father. This is the right view of God. You will see in Old Testament references, some click to, some link to father. But Jesus always calls him father. And so here we're seeing the right view. When I pray to him, I'm praying to him as father. They're used to other words. Lord, you know, and actually they used to never even say his name. But we know in the Aramaic, this is Abba or Daddy, like is how it would correlate to us. In the Greek, which it's written in is Pater, Father. It is a very intimate term. We are his sons and daughters, so we need to know our posture in this. We're his family. It's a real shift from legalistic law to personal relationship. Direct, intimate, personal relationship. Why? Because Jesus made a way that I could approach the king, the sovereign God, my father. I can walk right up to him and sit at his feet. And the only reason I can do that is because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Because a not so holy person was separated from God by sin and Jesus took care of that. And he made a way. He says, I'm the way. He's the way that I can walk right up to the Father. My Father. And have his audience. And then that third word, in heaven, it reminds us too that God's kingdom where he dwells is the heavenly realm. Our Father who's in heaven we dwell here on earth there's this clear separation but this gets better as it develops he's there we're here but he's also omniscient he knows everything he's omnipresent he's everywhere and he's personal to us because of Jesus it's an amazing thing to, with, to hold all that together and then he continues the second part of verse 9 our father in heaven may your name be kept holy not only is he daddy, pater, dad, father, he is also God. He is holy, perfect, distinct, almighty. And when I'm in his presence, reverence of the awe who he is too. And how do I hold that in balance? The very personal God who loves me and created me. And how do I stand there with Jesus in his presence and also know that I'm about ready to hit my knees because I'm in his presence? And I love that tension or that paradox as a Christian that I have both. And may your name be kept holy is kind of, I love this, is like may your name be kept holy also because of the way I live today. I am his image bearer. So how I live, <laughs> I, don't, I don't affect God's holiness, but I project it. And I, it's kept holy amongst those who don't know him through me. That's a big, important thing, don't you think? So when I say, may your name be kept holy, I'm saying, I'm offering myself to you for that. Whew, are you, now we're only in the first sentence. You guys all good with this? It gets better. It starts to be a connected. Let's go to verse 10. First part of verse 10. May your kingdom come soon. So remember, God dwells in the heavenly realm, but he's here also through Christ. We dwell here on earth. And what this is saying is, may your kingdom come soon. What it's actually saying is God's space, which is heaven, and our space, which is earth, is actually married. We're actually asking, can that kingdom come soon? We're talking today. Whenever we read about Jesus and his ministry is three years on earth, he keeps talking about the kingdom of God that is here now, partially, because he's brought it here. We're talking about his life and death and resurrection that made the kingdom of heaven come down partially. 
because before this I was separated from God. Now God dwells in me through the Holy Spirit. That is a taste of heaven now. So the kingdom of God is partially here. So saying, you're saying, may, may your kingdom come soon. We're talking today. May your kingdom come today. May it expand today. May that space become, look, can we look more every day like the kingdom of heaven is here now? And how does it look like, how does this world look like the kingdom of heaven is here? One life redeemed makes it look more like heaven. One life redeemed, one other injustice defeated, one defeat of evil, the presence of love, joy, peace, patience of God's spirit in us. All those things are signs that the kingdom is here and it's expanding and expands a person at a time. But not only that the kingdom will be here soon, but we're also praying that Jesus come back and let's bring the whole thing and let's be done with the pain, the suffering. We're ready for the promise of Jesus restoring everything we're back in the garden. It looks like heaven. Both of those are in here. And I think one of the harder things to pray is this one. I think it's this one. Like, well, why, Brian? Well, well, because I think we like our kingdoms. I think we like my work kingdom. I like my sports kingdom. I like my family kingdom. And I don't like God's kingdom interfering with my kingdom. And so this is a real yield to say everything about my life, my family, my job, my school, my whatever, I want to look like your kingdom because your reputation is more important than mine. Continuing on, second part of verse 10. May your kingdom come soon and may your will be done. As part of this, it's together. May your kingdom come soon, but may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is a major statement of trust. Your will, Father, is your plan. And the way your will and your plan happen as a kingdom invades this kingdom is I trust your word, I trust you, I trust your promises, I trust you with today, I trust you with my life. And when I do that, I follow his will. And when I follow his will, the kingdom invades. Does this make sense so far? And this wouldn't have happened without Jesus. I trust in your word. I trust your desire, what you desire. I trust your law. I trust purpose. And what's interesting is this is a good place to stop as we got to this whole prayer so far. Our Father in heaven, may your kingdom come, oh, sorry, uh, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as in heaven. This is kind of a grouping here. And what we're saying is, well, we want to be careful about this part of the prayer. This is focused on God focused on our father and what's interesting is we do not say this prayer sitting at a table in our backyard with a glass of tea saying god bring it whenever we pray this prayer we're saying god your name your kingdom your will let me help and let me be a kingdom bearer not i'm gonna sit in the yard with a glass of tea go get him god you bring it. Go bring it, God. And we tend to do that as Christians. God, would you just come down and heal our nation? Yes, he wants to do it through us. God, would you just do this? Father, would you just do this? Yes, we are the kingdom bearers. We are the church. We are his plan A of redemption for the world. So church, when we pray this, we pray, I want to join you in what you're doing. I want to be your image bearer, and I want to be your kingdom bearer. And so what we see in those first three, those first three petitions we call them as we see the Father's name, the Father's kingdom, the Father's will. We're starting with praise. This is all praise. Praise you, God. Praise that this has happened. Praise your will. Praise you. The next three things, and, and that's why we're going to encourage, always start in praise. We're going to talk more about it in a little bit. The next three things, there's six petitions in this, in this prayer. The first three are about God. The next three are about us and our dependence on God. Matthew 6, 11. Give us this day the food we need. Give us what we need. Underline need. I've been skipping, sorry. Underline these words. If you go way back, our Father, heaven, kingdom, your will, need. Underline need. Give us what we need, not what we want. 
daily bread is, is, is a concept of what we need, sustenance we need for today. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us, Father, what we need. And what's interesting here is the word we, <laughs> again. It's not give, Father, what I need. It's what we need. That there's no individualistic theme throughout this whole, this whole prayer. But the bigger theme here, give us what we need, is moving from our issue with adult independence and childlike dependence. Father, give us what we need. It realizes, when I pray this every day, that, Father, everything, this, even the gift of the sun coming in the morning, is from you. Everything is from you. I can do things. I get it. But we tend to become very independent. God, I got this. I'll come talk to you when I need you. But every day I wake up and say, I depend on you for everything today. And I know that. And it's moving from adult independence to childlike dependence, where we really want to be in this, this whole theme of the series. You know what I love about children is they run around all day long. I talked about this a couple weeks ago. They, walk, they run around all day long not worrying that mom and dad are going to take care of them or meet their needs, do they? And can we wake up in the morning, adults, and say, God, I'm going to run around all day and just be super darn happy because I know you're going to take care of us. Even when things are twi- tough, I know you will come through. Proverbs 30, if you want to write this down, Proverbs 38 through 9 says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, Who is the Lord? If I grow too poor or too poor, I may steal and thus insult God's holy name. Everything we have is from you. Help us to trust and depend on you today, Father. And run around like kids. Now, that's the first focus as we go from the three. That's the fourth one, the focus on us and our dependence on the Father. Let's go to the next one, the big one. The next focus is about saving our souls. And I don't know if many people see this, but in Matthew 6, 12, the first part, more important than our daily bread, forgive us our sins. At the heart of this is salvation, right? You're asking to be saved. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us, your version might say debts. Your version might say trespasses. They're all synonymous. I like debts. Forgive us our debts, because every time I go and do my thing my way and don't want to do God's way, it incurs a debt. But thank God Jesus carried my debt on a cross. Forgive us is to ask, save us from our sins. And this is so revolutionary. This part, I think, would have shocked so heavily the disciples because the only way they could be forgiven when Jesus was talking about this was to go to the temple, offer a sacrifice to be forgiven for myself and my family. And Jesus says, because of what I've done, you no longer have to do that. You can go right to the Father. Repent, turn, confess, and be forgiven. You have direct access to the Father be forgiven you do not need a priest you do not need a king you do not need a prophet as an intermediary so revolutionary is this thought why because Jesus says I paid that price I carried your debt second half of that where we struggle a lot as we've forgiven those who sin against us. It's interesting, this is right in the middle, and every time Jesus says you pray, this is really important. Father, forgive us as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And this one is, you know, I always think of it when it comes to forgiveness, there's three trajectories. There's vertical forgiveness, God. I think we all move pretty readily. We, we know what God, how he forgives us through Christ. We struggle on the horizontal, right? We struggle on the horizontal to forgive others because sometimes there's not repentance on their side or they haven't changed or whatever those issues are or we need to be forgiven. The third one is how much trouble we have forgiven ourselves. There's three directions in forgiveness. So what about forgiving others? You know, Pastor Dylan shared this morning, that was good. He goes, what is this forgiveness of others? 
And he said, <laughs> he said one way is it's, it's I take them off my hook and I put them on God's hook. <laughs> when somebody's trespassed or, or hurt me, I forgive them. I take a look of power. I, I truly forgive in love. I take them off my hook and I put them on God's hook and let God take care of the justice. Let him take care of the forgiveness. Let him take care of the reparation. But I don't let it have power anymore in my life. And I remember the, how much I'm on the hook for God too, right? Okay. But what's really interesting is we have forgiven, if you, I thought it was fascinating as I looked through all the translations of the Bible, everyone except the King James Version, this is in past tense. We have forgiven. Father, forgive us as we have forgiven. Well, that's what the Greek, it's there. It assumes we've already forgiven before we go to him. But I know what's interesting is like I can't forgive unless I understand the power of God forgiving me every day. And that's usually the power of how I forgive is because he has let me off the hook. But I thought that was interesting. So three things, give us what we need, dependence on God, forgiveness, dependence on him for that, and the power to forgive others. Then Matthew 13, Matthew 6, 13, and don't let us yield to temptation. Another prayer of dependence on the Father. This reminds us that every day we have an enemy who's going to come after us because we belong to the Father. Every day he's going to come and he's going to bring a deception. He's going to get us to believe a lie. And what we need to do is he's going to whisper those to us throughout the day. And what we have to do is not yield to him. Don't believe the lie. Stay with the truth. Don't yield to his lies. Temptation's not a sin. Believing the lies and following through is. Don't father today. He's good. I hate to give the enemy any credit, but he's good. He knows our weaknesses. He knows how to come at us. Father, protect us. This is a prayer of dependence. Father, protect us. Don't get cocky and say, come on, Satan, bring it today. You don't have that power. You do. It's Christ in you. It's his power. So, don't let us yield. Don't let us yield. Father, I need your protection, your power. And then it finishes, but rescue us from the evil one. Rescue us. I love that phrase, rescue us. I think Easter is the great rescue of the whole world. Rescue us from the evil one. Rescue us from him today. Not only today, but rescue us from the great tribulation that will come one day when Jesus comes back because he will fully expose evil. He will take it on, vanquish it, and he will rock the world of those who do not know him because he loves them. In his wrath, he wants them to wake up. Rescue us from that day too. You are looking at the masterpiece of prayer. The masterpiece of prayer. One thing I find really interesting, Jesus finishes this, it's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, but what I always pay attention to is what Jesus says next. Sometimes it's a switch to another story. I don't think it is here. So many of us would say, um, rescue us from the evil one, for thine is the kingdom of power and the glory. Uh, you'll find that in the King James Version. It was added later. It wasn't in the original context. There's nothing wrong with it, but we pray that way a lot. But Jesus, that's not the next thing he said in the original manuscript. This is what he said in the original manuscript. When he gave us the model of prayer, he said this. Oh, by the way, there should be a big BTW here. By the way, I want to go back to forgiveness. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. So important that he went right back after the end of the prayer and he says, this middle thing, forgiveness, it's a big deal. And it should take our breath away to think that if I refuse to forgive somebody, to offer them the same salvation that I get from being forgiven, that that might get taken away from me. And I know that's a whole other theological concept. Too much to go into today. 
happy to get your emails, dialogue about it. But this is powerful when Jesus says, by the way, here's the whole sermon, here's the model, but by the way, let's go back to forgiveness one more time. Church, it is so important to forgive others. And I always tell people when they're struggling is to make it a goal and get help to get there. But it is a self-imposed prison. Stay out of it. And use the power of how you're forgiven so readily every day to forgive others. It can be tough. If you need help with that, you let us know. That's what we love to do. So anyway, there's that prayer. A little bit of a side note. Jesus says, by the way, but it's interesting when Jesus gives us a Lord's Prayer, it's really not designed for us to say it verbatim. There's nothing wrong with saying it verbatim, exactly like it's spelled. But what he's actually given us is a model. First three things about the Father, next three things about us and our dependence on him. Every time you pray, think of those six things every time you pray. It's a model. And what we want to do is say, well, then how do I, there's six things sometimes hard to memorize. So there's a lot of neat little prayer mnemonics, uh, acronyms, things like that. But let's give you one today. These, this is actually your sermon note. I know you guys are used to me giving sermon notes all the way through. But here's your sermon note, and let's give you the model to pray. And it's the word pray. And some of you have seen this. It's been around for a while. But there's four things in here, that, and this models the Lord's Prayer. Maybe not in perfect order, but it captures everything. It starts with P, praise. When you pray, always start with praise. When our staff meet and our, and our leaders meet, we always start with praise. Why? Because it's not about me, it's about Him. And I am standing in front of the Father. I love to praise Him. Even when I'm hurting, it doesn't mean you can't go and bring up what's wrong or things. Sometimes we're hurting that bad. But always start. This changes prayer in our image of God. Start with praise. What is so amazing about Him? When I wake up in the morning, I take a breath and I praise Him. Thank you for today. It was not promised. Here we go. Let's rock. You and I, let's rock today. R, repent. That's the word that means to turn towards Him. When I'm not sorry, I don't turn towards Him. When I'm sorry, I do. Repent is to turn to Him and not only ask for that forgiveness that I need every day, but ask for it for others too, that I can forgive others. The third is ask, A. He knows, Scripture tells us, He knows what you're going to ask for before you even ask, but yet He desires to hear it because He's your dad. How many of us is, as parents know exactly, I can see my kid come, I know exactly what he's going to ask. But I still want to hear it anyway. Ask and ask for others and ask for the power to forgive. Ask, 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 and then do this. Wait for an answer. Stop and listen. And in the Spirit, he'll respond. And the third, the why is yield. This one's tough for us. Slow down. Listen in prayer. Yield means to trust. Trust like a child. Trust in his will. Trust in his promises. Trust in his way. Trust in his word. Yield to it. And if you add up those four things, they cover everything in the Lord's prayer. And so next time you're sitting somewhere and you're just like having your own day, it's like, and they say, Brian, would you pray? It's like, whoa, pray. Pray. Yes, pray. Let's start by praising him, right? Let's start by asking for forgiveness. Let's start by asking. We're standing here for a day this week because of Jesus. And he is still providing. Use that. Share it. It's a tool. And the one thing we want to do is we go into offering here and we just worship him. Our response to the word, our response to Jesus is beautiful.
we're going to continue in this offering prayer, this time of response. We're going to shift from private or personal or family-style prayer to the whole room. And we're going to put our prayers to song. And so each scripture of the Lord's Prayer that we broke down today is going to be in this next song we sing. Um, but as far as actual tithes and offerings go, most of us, or many of us, give electronically. If that's not you and you have something you would like to leave or a connect card, there are boxes at every exit. Um, and then will you stand? One other thing on our worship guide that I would point out to you in regards to prayer is uh, the MHK prayer movement coming up. It was at the top of the worship guide. Those were happening quarterly up until COVID, and then we couldn't gather, and so things sort of lost its mojo, but as we revive that, just keep that in mind. That is a powerful way um, on Sunday morning when the walls of our buildings divide us across this town. Those are no longer when the town comes together and Christians join forces in prayer. So if you are a prayer warrior, the room will be full of them. If you are a prayer, I get anxious around prayer person, um, I've, I've been to many and never once has somebody forced me to pray out loud, but you can be totally moved by the Holy Spirit and you can be surrounded by others praying. So keep that in mind, keep that on your radar, and let's close in worship this morning. Thine is the kingdom and the peace. 